everybody, it's Alec here. Welcome back to the Smashing Brands podcast. Today I have a special guest, Ted. Thanks for being on. You bet. Thanks for having me, Alec. You're so welcome. So let's get into it. So can you briefly describe, like, well, if somebody were to ask you, like, how you spend your time on planet Earth, what would you tell them? First answer would be, I'm a family guy. Um, I have two children, and uh, a lot of my time is is helping them with their journey through the planet and on the planet. So a 15 yeah. and 17 year old. Wow. And outside of enjoying life and i'm a very big outdoorsman kind of adventurer skiing hiking biking that type of thing um after the personal stuff my number one reason for being on the planet is to help founder owner operators um extract as much value as they can when they sell their businesses and that is why i get up every morning and that's why i love going to work and am passionate about what i do yeah, that's exciting. So yeah, I'd like to dive into that niche a little bit more. So basically, you know, there's a lot of marketing and branding agencies out there. And, you know, there's a power of, you know, being in a certain market or area or niche. So basically what I'm hearing from you is you help companies brand themselves. Well, I saw on your website, it's like branding for buyout, right? So that's sort of what you guys do is you help position companies and brand them in a way that helps them get bought out. Is that right? Yeah, it's, it, it's a great question. And you are right in that respect. I will say that we have a group of incredible storytellers and strategists and creatives. And I think that we're very good at transformation of taking kind of a, a brand in its current state and helping them create real outsized growth and value at any stage. But what we yeah. found over the years, and this really happened by mistake in the early 2000s, I was repeatedly branding myself out of a job, meaning yeah. I get hired nine to 18 months later, the company would be acquired um, for a lot of money. We get thanked profusely for the value we created, and then there'd be no more client. Yeah. And I said, this is a horrible business model. Um, and I realized that marketing has always existed to sell more product, service, or technology to a customer, but had Mar have our kind of capabilities been ever applied to not selling the product, service, or tech alone, but selling the asset, the company, the entity as a whole to a buyer, which is really the domain of investment banking and, and you know, other disciplines and after partnering with Babs and College and a, a Bain consultant, they're like, no one's doing what you're doing that we can find on planet Earth. This is a true niche and a huge opportunity to go unlock value that's always been there, just no one's ever unlocked it. So um, we work with a variety of businesses, both B2B and B2C at all stages, but our true superpower is branding for buyout. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. So what stage of like companies do you work with? For example, is it a company that's like been in business for a decade? They're like, hey, you know, I'm looking to get bought out, help us versus like this, you know, a company that's just getting off the ground saying, hey, we're just trying to brand ourselves in general and maybe an acquisition is a plan down the road. Is there like a certain stage of business that you work with? Yeah, another good question, Alec. Um, specifically for branding for buyout, the company is usually nine to 24 months out from an exit. They've already done a lot of hard work preparing the business, operationalizing the business, yeah. but they realize that perhaps they haven't really calibrated the brand as a whole and the company as a whole mm -hmm. in the best possible way to extract the most value to what the buyer is looking for. And um, a lot of companies just don't think like a buyer does. They are thinking from the inside out rather than from the outside in. So that's yeah. what we help them with quite a bit. And I would say that um, most of the time branding for buyout is reserved for mature companies that have been around, as you said, for maybe a decade, maybe a hundred years, because all of the data is there and they've matured enough that you really have a good sense of what their value is and what their value could be to the buyer. Right. We have worked with some really early stage companies that are so have nailed an idea that holds so much potential 
that we've helped them essentially accelerate what be, might be a normal three to five year exit plan, shorten that life cycle and extract the value or pre pre present the value to the buyer earlier than expected. Um, but just to be really precise, most of the time we're working with lower middle market companies. Mm. And technically that's five to 150 million in annual sales, but it's more like 10 plus, 10 to 150 million. Sometimes they don't have the best marketing services or marketing capabilities. They're smaller businesses. So a buyer has a mm -hmm. lot of runway to unlock for value creation, that type of thing. Cool. Yeah. Th thanks for that. So I'm, I'm curious, like when you're branding a company for buyout, how does that, what does that brand strategy specifically look like compared to branding to get, you know, customers and to yeah. grow their revenue? So there really is a huge difference when you think about any company that's trying to sell, by the way, needs to keep sales going up. They need to keep selling more product, service, or technology to a, to a customer because obviously that's what a healthy company does. And yeah. I think that's what the other 10 million marketing companies out in the world have always done is help people sell more stuff, right? Mm -hmm. It's a completely different strategy and a completely different view of the spend of dollars when you're thinking about how do you package up the company itself to get potentially acquired? Yeah. So there's both financial buyers and strategic buyers, domestic buyers, international buyers, and it can be a broad suite of opportunities. So first, what you have to do is really understand the M&A, the mergers and acquisitions landscape. In a particular category for a company that's potentially looking to exit, what's the exit activity been in the last three to five years? Who's been buying and selling what? Who are the potential buyers and what do they want? Because not all buyers are created equal. They want different things. Yeah. Um, understanding where the industry is going and helping the company skate to where the puck's going to be and present themselves as a thought leader and forward in their industry, not a Me Too brand. And also the kind of interesting uh, difference is when you're marketing to a buyer, you might be marketing to 10 or 20 businesses, not tens yeah. of thousands or millions of customers. So yeah. super rifle versus buckshot, right? I mean, it's it's very, very targeted and curated. And I'd say that the kind of another interesting thing is that in the best case, you're nailing the positioning and the marketing for the product, service, or tech to the customer and what the buyer is looking for. That intersection is really the sweet spot of what we do. Yeah, yeah that's, that's really interesting. So when you're like, let's say, marketing to 10 or 20 businesses compared to 10,000 as if you're marketing to a giant customer base, but is that more like designing like pitch decks or like what are some of these marketing materials and stuff like that? That's a, that's a good one. So I'm just going to refer to it compared to the industry norm. Um, mm -hmm. Leaders and, and, and don't get me wrong, they're very good at this, but investment bankers are very good at selling businesses and finding buyers and, and running a process. But their yeah. view of marketing an asset, which means the company, is putting together a 50 or 100 page SIM, a confidential investment memorandum, to PowerPoint, yeah. and a one pager. And the friction is that those two documents now embody the entire heart and soul of what you spent 10, 30, 50, 100 years of selling. And you have a banker selling your life's work and marketing yeah. work. So to, to build on that, because those two, those tools are important, but imagine if you put together a runway and a plan without executing the plan, but a runway and a plan of what the business and the brand and the marketing can do over the next one to three years. And you put that in front of the buyer. That's not done. That's atypical. And what if you tell a story to the buyer with video content and really bring to life the kind of heart and soul of what you've built. And what if you actually geofence particular buyers and serve ad content to them before the assets even for sale? For short money, you're increasing awareness 
in a very, very targeted area. Yeah. So it might be a warm door as opposed to a knock, knock cold door of an investment bank calling up and saying, Hey, we think we have an asset you might want to buy. Yeah. Yeah. So it's basically like when you talk about, yeah, you know, telling the story, the projections, it kind of sounds like a pitch deck, but it's positioned towards acquisition, not investment. Yeah. And, and there's a key variable there. I'm going to give you two kind of things that, um, the book that I wrote on the subject reveals a lot of people like, oh, so you're staging the house, you know, you're painting the house and you're baking the bread and you're making the house look really appealing for the buyer. Mm -hmm. That's true, but that is barely scratching the surface. And that's the easy part. What we're really doing is overlaying the condo community or the city to build, be built around the house because a buyer does not want to buy a, you know, present day valuable asset, they're buying the potential value that they're going to unlock over the next three, five, 10 years. So you yeah. have to show them the runway of what they're going to get. And in marketing, there's a lot of proof of concepts that you can execute to um, as breadcrumbs to the buyer and say, hey, look, we did a twenty uh, $50,000 direct TV test and that $50,000 test unlocked $200,000 of value. What if you put $2 million into that? So we are very much methodically positioning and building the brand and demystifying um, mm -hmm. the brand to the buyer. And also in super high fidelity, showing them all of the value that they can unlock. That's usually not done in the way we're doing it from a marketing and brand perspective. I think that's awesome. What has been your favorite success stories through working with brands? Well, I got to say, I, I I feel like we're helping people realize their dream. And when I say realize, I mean like manifest, monetize, make it real in mm. the sense of a lot of companies today are building to sell. And not always, but a lot of the time. Um, so every time I help someone have a big accomplishment, it is the best feeling in the world. I will say uh, probably the highest profile one that we've done is um, we were the fully outsourced marketing team to service a brand called Popcorners. They yeah. serve them on JetBlue. They're pretty much national. I don't know if they're international now, but it's a better for you triangular chip that looks just like a Dorito, but without any chemicals in it. Yeah, I love this. Better, better for you chip. Mm -hmm. And so for three and a half years, we helped Popcorners build their business, build their brand, sell more Popcorners. But Paul Nardone, the CEO, is very, very smart, very clever, multi-exit um, CEO. And his thesis from the beginning was a brand like Pepsi, who they eventually sold to, has a portfolio of businesses and brands very successful, but they're not better for you, right? They have... There chemicals, there's, you know, there's there's some bad stuff in there. And of course, yeah. the big trend is towards better for you, cleaner ingredients. And he was building this brand and make, making methodical choices and encouraging us to be thinking every step of the way of how to build this brand to be sold to a very big brand like a Pepsi. Yeah. And, so they sold in December of 2019, right before COVID for an enormous, you know, like really successful venture. But back to like helping Pepsi and the, the buyer unlock the potential value, Pepsi saw that value and we helped to try to plot a number of milestones and lily pads for the brand to grow into every step of the way. So I would say that's probably the highest profile uh, biggest success we've had to date, but we've helped a lot of, you know, and they fell into like the lower middle market category in terms of size, mm -hmm. but we've helped B2B tech brands, um, you know, literally brands of all shapes and sizes, um, you know, get to a, a higher value exit. That's interesting. How many companies do you think are like when they're building their brand at this level that are would you say they're just as focused on the end consumer buying their products as they are like at the same time positioning it in a way to be attractive to a big buyer? 
99% sell more product, service, or tech to customer. 1% if you're lucky, what is the buyer thinking about my business and what do they want to buy? Usually companies have to kind of reach a certain stage and then they start learning about how to prepare their business for an exit and they have a heart attack because they're like, oh my God, I had no idea. It might take me two years to get my company ready. And when I worked with Babs in college, what I found when I wrote my book and, and they were instrumental in helping me build my thesis and build my business case around what I have today what I also learned is there's almost no education, at least in the U.S. collegiate level, uh, education on how to sell your business. It's all on how to start and scale and raise capital. But the, the moment you raise capital is the moment you're basically signaling you're going to sell your business because those LPs are going to demand a return. So when you yeah. think about it, there most people have are clueless about how to sell their business. And by that time, they're so busy running their business. It's like going to night school to figure out how to sell it successfully. And you're so all consumed with the day-to-day -day operations and selling the business, you kind of have to build an outsourced team to do a good job to sell it. And that's a stressful thing to essentially lateral the ball to someone, you know, and, and provide high levels of trust that they'll help you navigate mm. through to a successful exit. And and not to go too geek out on this, but also there's inherent problems with the model today of investment banking. They're motivated to sell you quickly and be transactional to get onto the next deal because that's how a lot of them are incentivized. Whereas, mm. so think of it as they're doing a lifetime of deals. Whereas if you're selling your business, it's the deal of a lifetime. Though There's friction there. Yeah. And we like to think we're tucking into the middle of that to help both parties extract more greater value out of the um out of the ultimate exit yeah no that's that's really interesting so uh do you think there should be like so you think 99 percent of people aren't even thinking about exiting so you think from the beginning that should be a lot more people and that would I save them a lot of I think you should begin with the end in mind and everyone will tell you investment banking, private equity, everyone will tell yeah. you that to, to run a really successful business, you're always ready to exit. You've got audited financials, you've operationalized the business, meaning every business unit has a playbook because a buyer does not want to buy a business that's beholden on a CEO. They want to mm -hmm. take an entity and not rely on people, not have too much weight on a particular you know, product or customer, they want to de-risk it and they want to really understand how to extract all the value. So uh, in the 99%, it's probably a little bit better than that. But most key people, one, don't have the education, two, yeah. don't understand how much hard work it is to get a business ready to exit. And it's, it's a bit of a shock. And the last thing I'll say is statistically, most business owners they'll meet someone and say, well, your business is worth this much, but they're going to say, no, 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 it's worth this much because they put, they missed the soccer games and they've burned the mid eyed oil. So they want to extract as much as they can. And they often have an inflated sense of what it's worth. So somewhere between what I'll say the math says the EBITDA ratios and everything that the, you know, the, the math will yeah. tell you and what the founder wants. We're bridging that Delta between those two things. Okay, cool. So I'm curious about you, Ted. Like, so you've been in the marketing and advertising world for like over 20 years now, right? 30 this year. 30, yeah. So what's been your journey like briefly? Like, where did you start? And then how did that develop into, you know, where you are today? I know you briefly touched on it earlier, but. Yeah, I'll give you uh, three bullets. Um, one, I started in 1994 as an intern at Bronner Slossberg Humphrey which became Digitas, a big um, digital agency now, but it was direct marketing. And nice. I, walked, I walked in and my father, who was alive at the time, said, you're going to, on day two, you'll be the first to arrive and the last to leave every day for 30 days and they'll hire you. So this is an unpaid internship. So on day mm -hmm. one, they told me when to show up. So I showed up on time. And uh, then sure enough, and I, I was literally taking photos of stack cameras and placing type 
this was pre-digital and their goal was to be 100% electronic by the end of the year. So I yeah. walked into an interesting time. I uh, did exactly as he told me. 30 days later, they did hire me. And then I was one of the few people in the studio that knew all the uh, computer desktop publishing applications. Quark, Photoshop, Illustrator were the big three back then. So uh, everyone kind of naturally gravitated to uh, me to work on those applications to bring their ideas to life. So that, that was kind of the start of my career. Then I went from there to Arnold Worldwide, which had won Volkswagen, which is a big deal in the Boston market and the Drivers Wanted campaign was born. And I mm-hmm. touched a ultra 0.001% fragment of that, but it was an incredible ride. And in the direct marketing division, which I was in, I was actually allowed to participate in all the big pitches even though I was like in my early 20s. So I learned how to pitch at a really high level. And then in my late 20s, I said, you know, my dad was still alive. I said, should I go back to school? I want to go do this on my own. I want to start my own business. He's like, no, just go do it. Uh So I freelanced, worked for a B2B tech company, which is B2B tech's agency of the year called Greco Etheridge Group in New York. And then they actually... Um, 9-11 happened, the dot bomb happened. They went out of business. I bought all their equipment and computers at auction after they wow. had a with their with the founders, you know, um endorsement because it was painful. But they're like, if anyone's gonna go take another shot at it, we're glad it's you. Bought all their stuff and started my first business, ran that for 15 years, sold it, and here I am today. Nice. Yeah, well, what's been that journey like buying and you know selling your your agency? And I'm curious. Well, we'll start with that. So um, I would say that like a lot of first time owners selling their business, I had no idea what I was doing, and you know, it wasn't right. a it wasn't some huge windfall, but it was and it was an experience, and I learned a lot, and. Prior to doing that, I had already created the notion of branding for buyout and trademarked mm-hmm. my birth name. So it would stay independent of any entity that I might sell or um, mature in the future. Mm-hmm. And I always knew it had value. Um, but until I partnered with Babson, I didn't really have the ability to vet the idea and get kind of an international experience. So um yeah, I've learned a lot. And I just think that people should really educate themselves as much as possible about, you know, the buying and selling of businesses. Yeah, what was the focus on your agency? So back then, it was really pretty much a small creative boutique. And Mm -hmm. like I said, we started to begin, we were, you know, it was a great team, and we were doing great work. And a part of me just didn't know if it was timing you know, um, a lot of technology businesses where we just kept repeatedly getting into positions where we were building the brand and two or three years later, they were bought. And again, after enough times of that happening, Knucklehead realized that there's a bigger opportunity beyond fee-for-services. Our structure is now fee-for-services plus a cut of the transaction fee. And that, that is really a kind of game changer and on a lot of levels to have skin in the game and driving yeah. to a very particular outcome. Right. That's awesome. So how did you then get connected to the Grist? So the Grist, um, so the long and short of it is I uh, sold my business to a company called Breakaway Ventures. They had a marketing mm-hmm. group. Um, I took a full-time employee position as a CMO uh, right. to help build breakaway marketing. That was a great, wild, crazy ride. And then over time, um, I left. And then at one point, the CEO asked me to come back and take over the marketing group, which I did as the CEO. Mm -hmm. And um, the CEO really wanted to stay focused on his venture investing. And we basically just created a deal structure. I would take breakaway marketing from him and kind of Mm. peel two entities apart. But he wanted to keep the name Breakaway because it's a great freaking name. And Uh um, so we rebranded Breakaway Marketing to The Grist in 2019, right before COVID. 
Um, so that's how the grist I is. See. it is. And as to geek out on branding for a second, I had a bunch of bad names ready to go to rename the company. And my chief creative officer, Dan Madsen, was a genius creative operator, said, no, no, give me a couple of weeks and let me come back to you with a name. And he came back with grist, which lo and behold, actually can mean a swarm of bees, which he was keeping bees as a hobby. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. I love grist, but not for the swarm of bees. That's cool. But I love the concept of grist as it directly translates to taking grain from the field, grinding it up on a grist mill and turning it into flour. So the magic of transformation and value creation, I think is a great freaking story. And the grist is just a great name for, for what we do. So that's how that came to be. That's awesome. What do you feel like, you know, over the last several years, your biggest lessons as a leader has been? Um, well, I would say that over the last few years, I leaned heavily into executive coaching and getting an executive mm -hmm. coach. And my coach, Dan Guglielmo, has been fantastic. And what he then taught me is how to coach my team mm -hmm. and how to really listen and to empathize and realize that the only way I go up and level up is by giving myself and my time to my team. The more I do that, which seems counterintuitive, but I think people who realize that when you really give to other people and give to your team, that, mm -hmm. you know, all boats rise uh, accordingly. So I, I'd say that's definitely the biggie for me is that kind of enlightened self-interest where you really give, give to others and, um, you know, the magic of that return, it just happens. Yeah, so it's just more like leaning into people, uh, being more aware of their needs, what they need help with, all of that. So just like more of a communication transparency. Sort yeah, of I think that's I think that's fair, and I think in today's world of tech, cell phones, and massive preoccupation and distraction, that the human side, uh, and I and taking AI into consideration with this too, I believe that the and throw COVID in there. Human mm -hmm. connection, relationship building, and real awareness and presence in time with people is, is the big unlock for everything, for new business, for telling stories, for transforming brands, for helping people sell their businesses. It, it's being completely dialed into the here and now, human to human. Yeah. So, you know, we talk about, you know, this communication and being there for your team. Were there times in the past where like that wasn't as conscious in your mind and maybe it was just like move, 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 or where did hell, this realization come hell from? Oh yeah. I mean, I was a robot for 20 plus years where I was programmed to wake up early, grind myself to dust, deal with Boston commuting and yeah. the winners were people who worked 60 to 80 hours. Now, there are benefits to that, but there are a lot of detractors as well. And I always use the medical industry. And I don't know if this is still the case, but having residents work 18-hour shifts when they're wielding needles and drugs and helping people try to get healthy is not exactly logical. So yeah. the badge of honor of these poor doctors that get grinded to dust um, in the medical world, I think is a good one. It's like in the advertising world, it was expected I'd work until midnight and, you know, you know, just give everything you got and have nothing left at home, which is not a good strategy. Yeah, exactly. And I can see how that probably impacted your family life and a lot of other things. So and what do you believe now? Yeah. What do you believe is winning in your book now? Like, what is a successful career? What is a su successful life? Oh, wow. That's that. That's an awesome one. I, I meant post-COVID, I really feel like the silver lining in COVID was um, much stronger work-life balance um, in terms of the ratio of time. I believe I can be much higher performance in pocketed sprints, according to who I am, yeah. than long protracted periods of time when I'd burn out. I'd also say that the uh, coaching, which has become quite popular and more accepting now, 
is incredibly important on me realizing when I might be approaching burnout and when I should schedule time off, identifying, you know, my needs as a person, as opposed to just business. And, you know, for me, it's, it's it, it, finding something you love, if you're lucky enough to do that from a work perspective, which I am, and then, you know, doing what you love with as much intensity as you want, but also living your life with that equal intensity day in and day out, because as they yeah. say, it's not a dress rehearsal. And I'll give you one example. It wasn't exactly convenient and, you know, I didn't have all the cash lying around to do this, but it's been on my bucket list to take my family on a safari uh, mm -hmm. in Africa. So last year, you know, again, just kind of living by a new code, I'm like, I might not be able to do this someday, you know? So yeah. I'm going to drop the hammer and we're going to go to Tanzania and I've been planning it for 20 years. So don't get me wrong. It wasn't like <laughs> taking it off the shelf, but it's yeah. a lot more, in my mind of extracting and squeezing every day of life, every minute, every day, and really just being grateful for that opportunity. I really try to live my life like that now. Yeah. I mean, what, what advice would you give for somebody trying to balance entrepreneurship with being a parent? Um, I've done it. And uh, the kids' moms are is an entrepreneur too. So we had two entrepreneurial parents. Yeah. Uh, I'd say the number one piece of advice is make sure you are not um, putting so much time to your business and to your children. This is if you are have a significant other that you don't focus on your relationship or you have you are starting to realize that you're missing your family and your life because your business has taken over. If that happens, you need to make adjustments. You don't have to quit. You don't have to stop doing what you're doing, but you have to become more clever and more innovative to delegate, to create the time you need to spend on both. Because what you'll learn is on any given day, if one's doing really well and the other one's terrible or vice versa, you can hang in there. But when they're both uh, down, you're on your knees begging for mercy and uh, you have to get ahead of it and um, devote time equally and what do you feel like were some of the the big adjustments that made an impact for you coaching again was big um i would say um the just the realization of how much importance health has mm -hmm. in your life uh, you know it sounds cliche but you know like all that matters is your health it's so true in the business environment. If you're uh, not taking care of yourself while you run your business, you're gonna you're gonna lose valuable time when you're sick, your immune system's down, or you're traveling, you're eating like crap, and all those things happen. But you have to maintain kind of the healthy mental, physical, spiritual side of things if you're gonna really reach the upper echelons, I believe. Right. So I'm curious if you, let's say you were starting, you know, your company again, what advice, or let's say you were to have a conversation, you know, with the Ted who's just starting his company, what advice would you tell him? Um, if I'm just starting, I would say from a brand perspective, be ready to have multiple metamorphoses because mm -hmm. brand should be agile and it should start lightweight and you should build on it ir iteratively. Yeah. Um, so expect tacking and change. Um, you know, I'm always a fan of spend low or no money. Um, try to avoid, and again, this is situational because some companies have to raise money and that's the only way they're going to succeed. But, you know, I always try to not push money at a solution. I try to push innovation at a solution or a challenge and try to outthink the problem rather than put money to it. That's never my first choice. Mm. Uh, and then I would also just say, make sure that you're constantly toggling between the vision and where you want to go, if it's a good one, and the yeah. present day. The, there has to be a toggling between those things constantly. And if you just live in the here and now and you're reactionary, you won't get to the larger vision. If you just live with the vision, you're not going to get the 
the day to day. So you kind of have to bounce back and forth between both perspectives. Yeah, that's interesting. It reminds me of what like Gary Vaynerchuk says with like the clouds and the dirt. Are you familiar? Uh, I'm conceptually, but not not intimately. Yeah, it's similar like to what you said, which is like if we're only in the dirt doing the day to day, then we can't see what's ahead of us. However, if we only focus on the future, then we're not doing the work that's required today to get us to where we want to be. That's exactly right. I'll give one more like Accenture or one of the big consultancies. As I was reading about digital transformation 10 years ago when it was the big term, still is really. Mm -hmm. Digital transformation in these big companies often sell massive sea change opportunities within big organizations. But the problem is when you're really trying to boil the ocean, innovation outflanks you. So they talk about a bimodal work track, which is running the big transformation, but having a bunch of sprints daily that bounce up against it. You have to run two work tracks, not one. And you mm -hmm. constantly have to be agile because technology in the world and, you know, COVID and AI and whatever is going to get thrown at you along the way. So at any time you have to not just be prepared, but expect the pendulum to swing and expect seismic yeah. change at any time because you never know yeah. what's going on. Yeah. So rather than be like shocked out of your mind, you could have the mindset of saying, well, we certainly didn't expect that, but we've been told multiple times to expect big changes, and here's a big change. Now, yeah. having a heart attack, how are we going to respond? Mm -hmm. I like that a lot, Ted. So I have one last question for you. So let's say it's the end of your life, you're on your deathbed, and you get to leave the world with three truths, three things that you know to be true about the world around you. What are they? Love. Take a moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, love, love of family, friends. Most important. Um, I believe that you should strive to, if you can, leave some kind of legacy, some sort of mark in the world that's yours, signature. Um, for me, I believe it's branding for exit as the macro term. I de devoted my life to that. Mm -hmm. Um. And I would say, again, for me, the mentality of every day matters. Every day, like when I'm really freaking out or having a hard time, I'm like, this is one day. What am I going to do with this one day? Because I'm never going to get it again. And how am I uh, going to extract the value and joy out of this one day? I can tell you meeting Alec Mountain and doing this podcast is one of the highlights of my day. Because I hadn't met uh, you, I had seen your podcast, but this is a special opportunity to connect with another human and and get a little bit of my story out there. So gratitude. Yeah, I love that. No, and I'm grateful for you too, Ted. Well, awesome. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and wisdom. Where can the, the audience connect and follow you? Well, certainly the grist.com and brandingforbio.com and and you know my linkedin is uh, profile is probably where i'm most active on social media so ted schluter if you look that up on linkedin um and um yeah cool awesome well thanks for being on the show thanks alec i really appreciate it man